extraordinarily broad ranging, uh, creative. Um, they include uh, projects to organize just about anything or anybody. And uh, some of the most uh, sort of difficult problems he's faced and succeeded most of the time, and not all the time, of course. He's uh, been extremely generous with his ideas and his energies, uh, sharing and consulting with people all over the country and more recently around the world. He uh, had a, an amazing 38-year run as founder and chief organizer of ACORN. And since leaving there, he's taken his work to ACORN International, 12 nations around the world. And when I talk to people about the nations, Canada, okay, but uh, <laughs> you know, how about Kenya, um, you know, nations in Asia, South America, and Africa, and people's jaws drop. And how do you do that? Well, the person who can take on a challenge like that is Wade Rathke. And in more recent times, uh, apart from organizing, he's uh, very generously put pen to paper to share his ideas. And tonight he'll be talking about one of the efforts, uh, the battle for the Ninth Ward Acorn, rebuilding New Orleans, and the lessons of disaster. Wade Rathke. You know, not everybody can uh, find somebody they went to high school with to be able to introduce them. So uh, uh, with that sort of objective, uh, dispassionate uh, kind of introduction, I'm sure it's uh, part of the reason I do these, these uh, things um, is to have an opportunity to talk about my book, but also to have an opportunity to find out what people are thinking at different places around the world. Sometimes there are two or three of us, sometimes there are 20 or 30 of us who get together to talk about these things. So in some ways, the books are almost an excuse to find people and uh, hear in a different way. When I was with ACORN, we had 100 offices around the United States and lots of members, and you were always sort of drowning in input of uh, a million different kinds. And uh, no matter what you believe, most of it you wanted to hear. Um, but uh, ACORN International, I often joke, it's sort of different after having worked directly for a board and having to answer to people every day. To answer to people, for the most part, on Skype and email and only see them once a year or maybe twice a year, in some cases every other year, and in Buenos Aires or Lima or someplace like that, it's a different kind of reaction. As an organizer, uh, you feed off of what you learn from people. And, uh, I've often argued that uh, the key ingredient to making a successful organizer is your, abil your ability to listen. So these are opportunities to me, for me, and I appreciate the fact that uh, John suggested I uh, track down Odyssey, and Joan was uh, nice enough to be track downable um, to let me come and not only be here with you, but uh, talk about the books and anything that is on people's minds. Specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, the Battle for the Ninth Ward, as Danny just said. Um, partially because, as many of you know, here a year ago today in the Springfield area, uh, we had a tornado that went through a, a six mile or so swath of the city. And uh, there are many of these sort of, of, many of the problems that are attendant with that kind of disaster that we faced seven and a half years ago. In, uh, the terrible Hurricane uh, Katrina experience in New Orleans. And if, if I were asked, and I sometimes am asked, what some of the high points of the time, the 38 years uh, I was with ACORN was, I think one of the high points had to have been the struggle that the leadership and membership and staff and, of uh, New Orleans ACORN went through trying to, to find themselves, come back home, find, you know, win the right to return, and try to play a role in rebuilding the city. And this was a challenge for the organization, and uh, I would argue a challenge that uh, ACORN and its leadership rose to, you know, sort of show its best under uh, its real metal. At the time of the storm, uh, New Orleans ACORN had 9,000 members, dues-paying members, in the city of New Orleans. The city was about uh, 357,000 people, not a huge, you know, as the NBA says, a small market town. Um, but not a little larger than Springfield, certainly, but at the same time, 80% of the city flooded in Katrina. And 
uh, when some of our university partners in places like Columbia and Cornell did the GPS mapping of our membership, and places like the Lower Ninth Ward that have become iconic as, you know, uh, sort of stories and pictures of what, uh, what, it, what happens when a government essentially doesn't exist and deserts its citizens and democracy. Uh, in places like the Lower Ninth Ward, there was no block anywhere in the Lower Ninth Ward where there weren't Acorn dues paying members. And that was true in a lot of the lower income working populations. And what was uh, uh, amazing, and it was interesting earlier today, some of us talked about some of the commonalities between the Springfield experience in New Orleans, how many of these themes sort of uh, like bad pennies crop up in disasters. The, the notions that we're going to rebuild better than it was before, and what does that really mean, and the, the sort of uh, contrived, fabricated planning processes and input, which often are, you know, sort of elephantine labors delivering less than a mouse, and also don't, don't have the resources. Uh, there's often huge promises. Uh, I read a lot of the Springfield plan this morning. Um, Turns out it's a thousand pages, so I thought I was reading a lot of it. I think I was probably reading the executive summary of something in a thousand pages I didn't get close to. But uh, it was amazing to not only read uh, some of the things about Springfield, but some of the things that the same consultants were saying about New Orleans that had been involved in making the New Orleans plans, which uh, largely after seven and a half years uh, have gone unfunded. And uh, that's part of the promise of the Springfield Plan as well. Many things that could be done and whole acres of sections about the lack of resources to implement many of these things. And in some cases, you know, where one of the lessons of uh, the New Orleans disaster is that it all starts with housing and jobs. Once you're displaced and, you know, Everybody in New Orleans was essentially displaced. The ability to return is based on whether or not you have a roof over your head and a job so that you can put daily bread and livelihood uh, for your family. Not far after that is health care and education, but at the jobs and housing uh, issue, we had a situation in the immediate post-disaster period where we had jobs aplenty but no housing. So you had huge opportunities, and it was a question of who would be willing to come up. Uh, uh, the, the hurricane hit August 29th, 2005. We had our year-end meeting for our staff uh, with ACORN at the time. It was about 1,000 people met in Houston, and we, uh, right after that, I just drove my truck and my family down to Mexico because we were just burned to a crisp all the way down to Aguas Calientes and into the, you know, central highlands of Mexico. People would see my acorn rebuilding sign on the back of my truck and the Louisiana plate would come up to me in Spanish and ask, was there really work now? Were people on top of the roofs? Because people from Mexico would come right up after the storm to start, to start rebuilding. There hadn't been any money and it had gone back by December. So we had huge influx of labor and then a pull back because nobody had the insurance money and as it turned out the ability to access resources was a huge issue that prevented people from coming back. If you were a senior citizen or a family with children, you couldn't come back to New Orleans for quite a period of time. There still are no operating acute care hospitals in the city of New Orleans seven and a half years later. Ironically, the Springfield plan says a model for Springfield should be the two-lane medical system, uh, you know, pocket clinics program. But that's not a model for New Orleans, I can assure you, living there, although I was surprised to see it being touted as a best practice in, in Springfield. Um, they closed the school districts down. If you have young children, you don't exactly have a way to not bring them to school. So. You don't have a job, or you may have a job, but you can't get housing if it's a new job. If it's an old job, 5,000 school teachers were, were terminated within the first two months of Katrina, 2,500 city workers. It just went like that. There was a huge de-unionization of New Orleans. New Orleans has had the highest percentage of union uh, membership anywhere in the South. Uh, almost all of those unionized industries were depopulated. Teachers have been our largest single union. They were decimated. You remember when my local organized the city workers, John, 2,500 of those were gone. So it was one thing after another. It was sort of a, 
an avalanche of, uh, of difficulties here, but if you had